Welcome to the Past President. It's the 27th century BCE and Egypt's Old Kingdom begins. What's the date specifically? Historians use different chronologies to date these early dynasties, but the date that keeps popping up in my studies is 2686, so I'm going with that. And for our purposes of building an effective timeline, if you plug in Egypt's Old Kingdom Begins, 27th century BCE, you'll have your sixth date. So the Old Kingdom started with Zoser as the first pharaoh of the Third Dynasty. Some would say the Old Kingdom started with the Fourth Dynasty, but this era has been called the Age of Pyramids, so I want to include Zoser's Step Pyramid. It's not a true pyramid yet, as you can see, but because of it and its genius architect, Imhotep, we're a step closer to building actual pyramids. And the Old Kingdom is made up of three primary elements, a strong monarchy, a national religious identity, and as you now know, the pyramids. And I'll talk all about the pyramids in my next video, because it's the following century when the pyramid is truly perfected. But in this video, I mainly want to focus on the religion, because it's inextricably linked to everything else. And before we get to that, let's take a quick look at what historians mean by a strong monarchy. The first thing to know is that Manetho devised the system that we use today for Egyptian chronology by dividing up ancient Egyptian history into 30 dynasties, ultimately connecting each pharaoh to the time of gods, specifically to the god that created himself, a tomb. And I'll bring him up later in the video. And even though Manetho's system has been corrected here and there, most of it holds up to other sources and pyramid texts, so historians still use it. And since ancient Egyptian history continued beyond Manetho's life, modern scholars have added the 31st dynasty, the Macedonian dynasty, and the Ptolemy dynasty that ended with Cleopatra in 30 BCE. And Egyptologists have organized these dynasties into mostly kingdoms and periods. Periods were times of disunity and chaos, and kingdoms were times when Egypt was united under a strong monarchy. These were times when Egypt was prosperous, and the pharaoh was maintaining divine harmony on earth under the idea of Mat. Mat was an important concept for Egyptians because it represents justice, morality, and divine order. If Egypt was stable and prosperous, then the pharaoh was believed to be aligned with this idea. Now, practically speaking, the Old Kingdom flourished because it was able to stabilize this strong, centralized monarchy with an efficient bureaucracy. This allowed the kingdom to effectively subdue, tax, and manage the 42 gnomes across the country, while at the same time maintaining beneficial trade networks beyond its borders and protecting its borders from invasion. This stability, wealth, and monarchy allowed the pharaohs to have complete control over their citizens, and the pharaohs were not afraid to use these citizens for lavish public building projects. So these are the practical elements that allowed the Old Kingdom to flourish, and it seems to be the same practical elements that all thriving monarchies possess throughout history. But what makes ancient Egypt unique is that its success was fueled by its religious culture, and I want to spend the rest of the video discussing that. It's important to understand ancient Egypt's religious culture, because once you do, you'll understand the motivation behind its more famous relics that really take root in the Old Kingdom, the pyramids, its iconography, mummies, etc. Egyptologists like Toby Wilkinson, Bob Breyer, and others all seem to say that Egypt's religion, or myths depending on how you view it, is vast and complicated and even contradictory at times. However, there seems to be a few core stories and beliefs that really shine a light on how the ancient Egyptians viewed their world, and therefore how they organized their society. I've heard these stories or beliefs named under various titles, but for clarity, I'll call them Creation, the Death of Osiris, and the Afterlife. Let's start with Creation. In the beginning, there were eight primordial gods that represented chaos, called the Ogdod. They consisted of four sets of male-female pairs that are often depicted as frogs. And they are formlessness, darkness, hiddenness, and the primordial waters. You'll notice that the Egyptian gods' names below each term, and each name that ends in a T is female. And before we move on, I want to give a quick shout out to water. Not only for being responsible for destroying mankind and many of the world's myths, as I discussed in my previous video, but also for being an important substance for creation stories around the world. As in, before creation, there was the primordial waters. In Mesopotamia, for instance, a Babylonian creation story called the Enuma Elish states that before there was anything, there was Absu the sweet water and Tiamat the salt water. Even in the Bible, right at the beginning, Genesis 1 through 10, it says, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. These separated waters became the sky and the sea. 
Then God gathered the sea into a single basin so land could appear. In the Egyptian creation story, land rose from the primordial waters, and this land was known as the primordial hill. On top of this hill, the god Atum appeared. He created himself. Then from him, all the other gods were created. Atum had four children that represented air, moisture, earth, and sky. Then the earth and sky gods, Gebanut, produced four more gods, Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. Finally, Osiris and Isis, who are a brother-sister, husband-wife duo, and are often used to justify marriage between brother and sister, got together and had Horus. If you happen to watch my video on Narmer, you'll remember that each pharaoh is believed to be the god Horus and is represented by the falcon. So since the pharaoh is Horus, and therefore directly connected to a tomb and the beginning of time itself, the pharaoh is on earth to maintain divine order. And for anyone to question or reject the pharaoh, then they would be questioning or rejecting this order and creation itself. Therefore, this is the divine justification for the pharaoh to have absolute power. Pretty convenient if you're the pharaoh. Now, that doesn't mean that all pharaohs identified with Horus. Some identify with Seth, others with Ra, but by understanding the story, you can more easily understand those anomalies when they appear. Osiris is another god directly connected to the pharaoh, and this story helps explain why. It also reveals a lot about Egyptian culture itself, especially funerary practices. And here's the main plot points in a nutshell. Osiris and his wife Isis were tasked to civilize the world. Seth, their brother, who represents evil, was jealous of Osiris and wanted to kill him. So Seth tricked Osiris into stepping into a coffin of his exact dimensions, nailed it shut, threw it into the Nile, and Osiris died. In grief, Isis went on a long journey looking for the coffin, found it in Byblos, and brought it back to Egypt for a proper burial. But before the burial could take place, Seth found the body, cut it up into 14 pieces, and scattered them all across the Nile. Isis went on a long journey again, found all the pieces except for the phallus. So Isis reconstructed an artificial phallus, put Osiris back together, and resurrected him long enough to become pregnant by him. When Osiris died again, he became the god of the dead. Isis then gave birth to Horus, and now Horus ruled in Osiris' place. Then Horus and Seth fought. Horus loses an eye, but it's regenerated, and Seth is finally defeated, but not killed. So there's a lot to unpack here, so let's start with Horus again. When the pharaoh is alive, we know the pharaoh is Horus on earth, and Horus is represented by the falcon. And on many statues, you'll see falcons sculpted right next to the pharaoh. The idea is that when the pharaoh's mortal body dies, the god Horus, or the falcon, leaves the dying body and joins with the next pharaoh. And the dead pharaoh's soul becomes Osiris in death. So each pharaoh is Horus in life and Osiris in death. The god of the living when alive, and the god of the dead when dead. I also mentioned that Horus fights his evil uncle Seth, but doesn't kill him. This represents that the pharaoh can defeat evil, but can never get rid of it. And it can never be too idle either, because evil is always lurking. It can rise up again and again at any time. And there's other parts of the story that seem to explain the funerary customs of ancient Egypt. For instance, Seth designed a coffin to Osiris' exact measurements. We see this exactness in the famous anthropomorphic coffins inside the more elaborate tombs. Another example is that Isis brought Osiris back to Egypt and put him back together. She even created a prosthetic for his missing phallus. This represents the belief that in order to be accepted into the afterlife, you must be whole, you must be preserved, and you must be buried in Egypt. This explains why there's mummies and why some have artificial limbs. And it was also important not just to be buried in Egypt, but to be buried on the west side of the Nile. Since the sun was born every day in the east and died every day in the west, death was associated with the west. So dead people were called westerners. Finally, I mentioned that Isis went on a long journey. This represents anyone's life journey that is filled with challenges. And no matter how difficult one's life is, it's important to live according to Mott. I'm sure you recall that I said Mott was important for the Pharaoh, but it was also important for anyone who wanted everlasting life. As I mentioned earlier, Mott represented justice, morality, and divine order. And if Egyptians, not just the Pharaoh, lived a moral life, free from sin, then they were allowed into the underworld after death. How it all worked was that, upon death, each person was presented before the throne of Osiris, and their heart, which was believed to have contained the soul of each person, was weighed on a scale against the feather of truth. If the soul was full of sin, or heavy with sin, then the scales would be unbalanced, and the heart was gobbled up by the god Amit, and the soul would cease to exist. If the heart was balanced against the feather, then the person would have to stand before 42 gods and swear an oath. If the oath was accepted, then the soul was accepted too into eternal paradise. So that's it, our sixth date, 
27th century BCE, Egypt's Old Kingdom begins. Only 47 dates to go. And now that you have some insight into Egypt's religion, in my next video, we'll be ready to discuss the pyramids. If you have any questions or know a lot already, in the comment section, please post anything you think is essential to understanding this century or this topic. If you're adding new information, please cite your sources. I'll be monitoring what's going on, and in my conclusion videos for this project, I'll highlight how we've expanded its historiography and list any questions that seem to be left unanswered. At that point, we'll have a stronger foundation for my next project and all future projects. And of course, if you're an expert and you want to share your knowledge to help guide us, please feel free to join the conversation. Or if you're interested, I'd love to interview and post it right here. So contact me. If you just found me for the first time and are curious what this is all about, go check out my intro videos to both this project and this channel. And as always, subscribe, like, donate some money to keep the show going, click the notification so you know when the next video is up, and I'll see you then. <laughs>